Well, can one lousy grain of gunpowder in your cartridge improve your rifle's accuracy by double? <laughs> Are we maybe reading fake emails on this podcast? And how do you stop flinching when you're shooting a 44 Magnum revolver? And does shooting in the rain change your trajectory? We're going to find out the answer to those questions and more on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors Podcast. Hello, everyone. Boy, we have a convoluted mess of questions and answers and corrections this time. So I hope I can get through it in good shape with your help. So first of all, this question about um, one grain of powder making your rifle twice as accurate. Actually, the reader who sent this one in asked if it was possible for it to actually be decreasing his accuracy significantly. We're going to get to that one pretty soon. But the first thing up I want to cover is something from a gentleman named Deer Busted who saw something we did on determining right or left eye dominance. And I used my finger as an example of a front sight on a rifle. And I said, now, put your finger on an object uh, like the light switch across the room. Right now, I'm doing it on the lens of the camera. So when I'm looking at the camera right now and my finger with the front side of my finger on it, if I close my left eye, it's still there. But if I close my right eye, bam, my finger jumps over to the right of the camera lens. And that's how I determine that I'm right eye dominant. This gentleman says that doesn't work. He says, I noticed you, you moved your finger slightly as you open and close each eye. This is uncertainty. Make a diamond in the web of your hands by covering one hand with the other, focusing through that diamond on something about 10 yards away with both eyes open, and focus through that diamond, and then slowly pull your hands to your face while staying focused. So now I am going to use this little diamond on the lens with both eyes open. <laughs> Actually, I'm preferring my right eye already. <laughs> I could see that. And then as I slide it up, I'm not going to slide it to my left eye. It's my right eye. So I think you could probably start with a larger diamond or even a circle and then look through it, see your target, bring it in, and that'll do it too. Both systems work, folks, so whatever works for you. But that is what you want to do before you start training to shoot. And I have a grandson who's around uh, seven years old. We're starting him shooting, and he is strongly left eye dominant because every time he holds a rifle, he's just leaning way over it so he can see with his left eye. So I'm forcing him to try to shoot left-handed. He's not real happy about it, but being seven years old, it's all new to him. He's going to learn just fine. His sister, on the other hand, bright eye dominant, and she shoots beautifully. All right, uh, let's see. Here's one about rain. User EG says, hey, can you do a podcast or a video on the effects of shooting in the rain? Accuracy and downrange velocity. I've never seen that covered. Thanks for the great content. Now, I cheated. See, I got these on paper now, so I've read these already, which is good because I was able to do a little ballistic research on this one. I do know that shooting in the rain is the opposite of what our brains tell us it should be. We figure water is denser than air, so it's going to slow your bullets down. Rain's going to fall on top of your bullets to make it more heavier. There's going to be more air friction, and it's going to drop more. The opposite is true. When shooting in the rain or high humidity, your shots will go higher, but not much. Why would they go higher? Because the air is less dense. And the biggest deal with humidity is the fact that it, when it's humid or raining out, especially raining, if it's raining, it usually means that there's a low pressure front. Low pressure means less air density, less air pressure. So your bullet's going to fly higher. There's less drag. But the humidity is not really water falling through the air. It's a gas. So water's in a gas form, I guess, in the atmosphere. So what I wanted to know was how much change would there be if I shot a particular load and a particular bullet with zero humidity out in a desert. And then I shot the same load with no changes with 100% humidity. And the difference at 500 yards was just over one-tenth of an inch less drop with 100% humidity. And in velocity, there was about six feet per second more velocity in the 100% humidity environment. Essentially, 
Don't worry about it. Whether you're shooting in high humidity or in the rain, it doesn't amount to diddly. So there's one thing you can stop worrying about. Pay a little more attention to wind deflection. That's the tough one. All right, let's see what's next here. Um, Jaded is asking me about my channel. He says he's been a fan for some time and he enjoys the content. Jaden says, uh, or Jay Dead says, I understand that you hunt all over the world and you spend time out in far de off desolate places more than your average person. My question to you is, have you ever seen or experienced anything that you could not explain? Maybe you saw something that threw you for a loop or you had an experience that you couldn't explain. I'm curious to know. Anyhow, thanks and God bless. <laughs> now, Jaded, I think... You're probably alluding to something like do 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 we're in the twilight zone. UFOs, maybe Sasquatch or something like that. Boy, you know what? I'd like to tell you all about this strange adventure I had out hunting once, but it turned out to be just a moose. <laughs> No, I have had no extraterrestrial visitations while I've been out around the world in strange places. I've seen no un indeterminate beasts, um, really nothing out of the ordinary. I have never been prone to that sort of thing anyway, uh, other than when I was a teenager and I was really infatuated with the idea of UFOs and such. But I've gotten pretty pragmatic as I grew older, and I just studied nature and tried to understand and figure it out. And uh, I think as a result of that, I don't imagine strange things are happening out there. And that doesn't mean I wouldn't know a weird old thing if it did happen, but I really can't say that I did. Uh, one of the stranger things that did influence me a little bit that way was the first time I went north of the Arctic Circle and saw the northern lights. I got quite the weird feeling when I looked up. You don't see northern lights when you're at the Arctic Circle to the north. They're right up above you and even coming, arching back to the south. And it is really strange and weird and beautiful the first time you see it. That sort of affected me in that unsolved mysteries kind of a way. But yeah, I really have not seen anything that I couldn't explain in nature. I mean, there are plenty of things about nature that I don't fully understand, but not in that do 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 twilight zone effect. <laughs> But thanks for acting, Jaded. I wish I could have told you I once saw the Loch Ness Monster, but it didn't happen. All right, now, here's someone who thinks I may be doing fake emails here. This is pretty interesting. This gentleman's name is Don. He says, the best thing you could do for this channel is stop, capital S-T-O-P, reading wannabe emails. Please, that's capitalized too, please stop, exclamation point. I don't care about some schmo down the road from me rambling on and on about some dumb thing. <laughs> I have a sneaking suspicion that you are writing the supposed emails because they're suspiciously with perfect grammar and you're schooled in the English language. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Now, oh, before I come to my defense, it looks like the team put some others who are defending me here. They saw his comment and they wrote in, Oh, uh, no, this is another complaint along the same regards here. It's from uh, somebody called, I can't even read what this gentleman's name is. At any rate, this person says, at 60,000 subscribers, no one is sending this guy letters. He's just reading his own handwriting. So there you go. Both these people are on the same page. So here are the defense. He's reading off of his laptop, so when he says letter, he's likely referring to an email or a direct message. Another guy says, earlier fans of a channel tend to be the most dedicated. And uh, Jick1 says, considering that neither of his channels nor his website contain postal details, you're almost certainly correct. They're not letters. Some people are overly literal. And uh, another one says his main channel has 364,000 subscribers and he's been writing for Hunting and Outdoor Magazine since the 1980s. He's hardly unknown. <laughs> well, guys, I'll tell you what. I do not make up these letters. These are genuine and they're not from schmoes down the street. These are my fans. They're good people. And <laughs> they may not have perfect grammar, but I sometimes make up for that as I'm reading. So... I hope I didn't fool too many people like these two folks. But these are all genuine emails and letters. And if you would like to have your comments read on the show, you can comment directly to 
the comment section on YouTube for both the podcasts and my regular Ron Spomer Outdoors channel. And we take some of those off of there. The team also pulls them off of our website where we have a comment section. So go to ronspomeroutdoors.com. That's our website. And on the bar across the top, it says leave a comment or something like that. That's a good place to do it. You don't have to go to the post office to send me a written letter. <laughs> I don't get very many of those. That gentleman is right about that. Now, while we are on the topic of communications and sending in emails and such, I would like to discuss a little bit about putting things in context so I understand what exactly you're referring to. Because quite often, if not most of the time, comments will respond as if the commenter thinks that I know what's in his head. He reads a line or hears me say something and immediately comments on that without letting me know what the reference was. I have to get this stuff in context or I don't understand. So here's an example from Richard. And this came in a comment on something I did on a 6.5 Creedmoor versus a 6.5 Swede cartridge. And Richard said, except the 22 high power is a fair bit larger. 22 high power? Larger? What, I, what's he talking about? So I want to understand and help him out. So I scratched my head for a little bit and I looked at the title. 6.5 Creedmoor and 6.5 Swede. And he said the 22 high power is a bit larger. So I thought, well, I will answer him thinking that he is thinking that the 22 Savage high power is a larger cartridge than these two 6.5s. So I wrote back, um, larger than what, Richard? The old rimmed 22 Savage high power of 1912 is shorter and narrower than both the 6.5 Creedmoor and 6.5 Swede. It also spits a narrower, lighter 2 to 8 inch diameter bullet. Or were you perhaps referencing a different comparison cartridge? Richard wrote back, as per your comment for 22 caliber bullets being the same size, including the 5.56 HP, yes, rimmed cartridge, however, 22 caliber bullets, which there is not perfect grammar, so that got a little bit confusing. And then it occurred to me that I had said something in the production of the 6.5s about cartridges all having the same diameter bullets in a class. So all the 22s would use 0.224 inch diameter bullets. All the 308s would use 0.308 inch diameter bullets, etc. That must be where he picked up this Savage thing or, and the Savage high power cartridge using a larger bullet. So he was right on if I had just understood the context or where he was coming from. So that's why I suggest that everyone either make a comment about what I said that set you off and then correct me or put in your comment so I know where you're coming from. That would help a lot. So in essence, you could say, Ron, you said X, Y, Z. Actually, it's Y, X, Z, something like that. It helps me understand where you're coming from. I hope that makes some sense. Let's try another one here. This is uh, sort of telling us about the importance of word choice and clear communications. Now, I can generally read through. My wife can help me a lot on this stuff. She's more intuitive than I am. I'm pretty literal. And she'll say, no, no, what he means is, and that helps. But here's a gentleman called Stu. And he says, Ron, I'm wondering about how MBPR is affected by lower rifle accuracy. Now, there's just a simple typo. It's MPBR, maximum point blank range. No problem seeing through that. Now, lower rifle accuracy, I'm wondering, what is maximum point range range having to do with poor rifle accuracy? But he continues, I followed your advice and I bought a cheap rubber de-resonator for my Enfield number no. 1 MK3 rifle. It brought my 40-yard groups down to an inch. It's set up using a 6-inch MBPR. Again, the wrong one there. I think that that would mean anything under 243 yards would be point and click. Now, I'm getting confused with this language here. However, since it's two and a half MOA, I'm imagining that at 243 yards, that six inch circle would effectively be a 12 inch circle. Does that sound right? No, that does not sound right. The calculator says that it's a zero at 208 yards. So if I add plus or minus two uh, point. 0.8 by 2.5 MOA, I get a range of 
minus 5.2 inches at 208 yards. It makes sense to me if they if it makes sense to you, and it doesn't make sense at all. I was really confused about this one. And this is, I think, why it's so important to concentrate on some context, some references, and clear language. Now, I uh, wrote back to Jeff, and he wrote back to me, and we eventually figured all this stuff out. But here's why I got confused. When he said uh, maximum point blank range, six inch, I think what he meant was a six inch target by which he determines his maximum point blank range. That's the only thing that made sense. So you have to decide, are you going to set your maximum point blank range using a six inch diameter target or an eight inch or a 10 inch? That's an important part of setting up your maximum point blank range. But he said he used a six inch maximum point blank range when really he was using a 240 some yard maximum point blank range. Big difference. So I was kind of sorting through that, trying to figure it out. And essentially what he was confusing was his rifle group size with what was going to happen out there at his maximum point blank range. And he made it additionally difficult on himself by zeroing at 40 yards instead of 100 yards. Got really confusing that way. So I think what you want to do is try to stick with standard things like sighting your rifle in at 100 yards, choosing your maximum point blank range target diameter to determine the actual reach of your maximum point blank range, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it, it got real confusing here, but we eventually straightened it out. All right, now here's a gentleman who wants some advice about accuracy in his bullets. And this is where that one grain more or less powder thing comes in. Ron, I need some advice for my buffalo hunt in Zimbabwe at the end of October. I think I found that my 416 Remington load is good with a hammer, shock hammer, 325 grain bullet, seated 3.6 inches maximum SAMI length of his cartridge. This is all good. 83 grains of Varget powder, Remington brass, Federal match grade, Magnum primer. Now, this is a good example of how to put it all in a clear language we can understand. Jeff says, I'm getting consistent three-quarter inch groups. I got it three times, so it means he's consistent, like he said. My dilemma is that I'm getting 2,781 feet per second velocity, which seems high, especially for Zimbabwe in October, which is pretty hot. Not showing pressure signs, but it's only 80, 89 degrees outside right now. When I drop this load one grain of powder, it drops the velocity to 2,649 feet per second. But the groups open up to 1.6 inches average. That would certainly kill a buffalo, but I'd kind of like it to be as accurate as possible. So by dropping one grain of powder, his groups went from three quarter inch to 1.62 inches, more than doubled in size. That's a big deal. So he asks me if I think that seems normal. So I wrote back, well, that does seem like a big change in accuracy, but some barrels are notoriously fussy. The oscillations change just enough to scatter your shots, but your high velocity does not surprise me. I consistently get 100 to 200 feet per second more speed out of hammer bullets at the same load densities recommended for the same weight bullets of other manufacturer. If your cases aren't showing high pressure signs, I think you'll be fine. Modern powders like Varget are not temperature sensitive. So even if the temperatures in Zimbabwe in October are high, you're probably not going to get any increased pressure or velocities because of that Varget powder. That is an example of a clearly spelled out question that I was able to answer, I think, fairly easily. So that kind of recommend folks try that approach and I'm going to be just fine with some of these answers. All right, now here we're going to get to the flinching issues. Got a couple of recently about flinching. This is Tony regarding flinching. I did a report on a gentleman who said that his father used to hit him with a newspaper when he flinched. His dad would give him his rifle unloaded. Kid didn't know it. He would shoot, and if he flinched, dad would whack him on the head with a newspaper. <laughs> An interesting way of curing a flinch. And Tony refers to that when he says, hey, my dad, who was a Korean War veteran, 1951 through 53, taught me to shoot as a kid in the 1960s. But he was never this extreme by hitting me. But 
his constant instructions about safety. Once, while returning home from shooting, when I wasn't looking, he slipped a cartridge into the clip of my rifle and said, You told me this weapon was cleared! Fast forward 10 years, and I joined the Marines in 1976. Did six years and four trips overseas. Great times. Thanks, Dad. Rip, Marine, Semper Fi. Hey, that's a nice letter, Tony. And thank you and your dad both for your service. So th this, I could just see an old Marine doing this. His boy is out learning to shoot, and the dad is just focusing on safety, safety, safety. Keep your muzzle pointed in a safe direction. Keep your action open. Make sure your rifle is completely unloaded. <laughs> and then when they're done shooting at the range, I can imagine the boy has been instructed by dad to say, okay, dad, the rifle is clear, meaning it's empty. I checked it. It's empty. We can put it in the car. And dad slipped around into the magazine and then showed the boy and said, I thought you said this thing was... <laughs> So he was messing with him, but he drove home the point. So it's not a bad trick. <laughs> a little bit unfair to the boy, but I <laughs> seems to appreciate it all these years later. Oh, man. All right. I think that gets me through all of this convoluted mess of all these pages taped up and everything else. <laughs> so thanks for your patience on that. I think we might have enough time here for some quick questions and maybe some comments and see what we got here on the computer. These I haven't seen before. Bob from Pennsylvania. Hi, Ron. I watch your videos routinely and I value your opinions. I am scheduled for a Western elk hunt next year. I'm trying to decide which caliber rifle to take on the trip. I have four choices. All are bold action American made rifles in varying calibers. Savage model 110 and 270. Good one. Winchester pre-64 model 2. 70 in a 308 Winchester, another good one. Remington 721 in a 30 out 6, another good one. And a Remington Model 700 with a 26 inch barrel in 257 Weatherby Magnet. All the choices have perfectly acceptable hunting accuracy. No shots will be taken at more than 400 yards. Quality solid or bonded bullets will be used regardless of the caliber rifle choice. My preference is to take the 257 Weatherby Mag followed by the 270. I will, however, take either of the 30 calibers if you think my first two choices are insufficient for elk to 400 yards. So please let me know your thoughts. Kind regards, Bob. Hmm. Bob, I like your 257 Weatherby Mag idea, but 400 yards is maybe getting out there on the ragged edge with that one. But the right shot placement should do the job for you. What you start to run out of at 400 yards is the infamous shock effect from those weather beasts. At closer ranges, you're going to have the maximum velocity. But things start to fall off pretty good out there at 400 yards, especially with most 25 caliber bullets. They just don't make a lot of really long, sleek, high BC bullets that hold on to their energy at that distance. Uh, I still think you should be fine with it. But I would recommend using a copper bullet like one of the hammers that we discussed earlier or a Barnes X, TTSX, that kind. Um, but then, he, ah, golly, I think I'm going to go with your 270. I don't like the 308. Everybody knows that. It's starting to run out of steam out there. It'll do the job. Don't get me wrong. Um, the 30 out 6 will be a little bit better, especially using heavier bullets, which I would recommend. I would go with a 165 grain or 180 in the 30 out 6, maybe a 190 with a real long high BC styles. Um, and in a 308, man, you get much above 165 and it starts to run out of gas. Um, the 270 with 150 grain bullet, that's what I'm going to go with. But if you really love that rifle, that 257 Weatherby Magnum, that makes a big difference. You know, just appreciating the rifle that you're carrying and having faith in it. So I don't know. I don't think I've really helped you much here, Bob, because I could see any of them working just fine. But I think my first choice would be the 270. As far as the cartridge, I would get a good 150 grain bullet with a high BC on it. And you're going to be smoking with that one. But not too far behind with that 257 Weatherby. All right, North Idaho. Ron, I love watching your videos and reading your articles. This is from Craig. I've become a become a fan and I'm reaching out to you for some information. Now, here's the deal. I inherited a Waffenfabrik Obendorf half octagon, half octagon, half round barreled Swedish Mauser 
from my grandfather, Papa, after he recently passed away. He was a gunsmith back in the 50s and 60s, and he continued tinkering throughout his life. We have found some really cool stuff that he was working on. This rifle is one of his projects, and it appears to be a Wildcat. Now, this Mauser has 270-308 etched on the side of the barrel. I pulled the barrel and confirmed that it was originally stamped for the Swedish 6.5. Thinking that he used a 308 parent case, I tried to chamber an empty 260 Remington case and a 243 Winchester case, but neither would allow the bolt to close, so I was baffled. I used Cerosafe to get a mold of the chamber and find that the shoulder was actually cut to a steeper 45 degrees instead of the parent 20 degrees. That's what I guessed was happening on that deal. I measured the bore and it has been cut to 277.277 inch. That's 270. I have pictures of the Cerosafe mold and measurements in a crudely drawn schematic to share if you're inclined to help with this mystery. I'm interested in next steps. Which brass to start with if I need to fire form a case? Do I need to fire form a case? Could this be similar to an Ackley proof chamber? Etc. Many thanks, Craig. Yeah, Craig, that's what I'm thinking here is that your pop here, he was making a Wildcat 270 308. So he took a 308 case Blew the shoulder out, probably increased the, the walls on it for less taper a little bit. And that might be why it's not chambering. Now, when you make it an Ackley Improved, which it sounds like this is, and not only do you make that 40-degree shoulder on it, you usually flatten out the walls as much as possible. A little bit of taper is left in them, just enough for easy extraction. But if he has enlarged all of that, that 260 ought to fit in there. Um, because usually the the head spacing on the shoulder is the same on all the Ackleys. Even though he changed the from 20 degrees to 40 degrees, you could still chamber around and fire form a factory load to get the brass to expand out and, and fit. Now with the 270 308, of course you can't do that because there are no factory 270s on the 308 action length or case size. So it's a little bit of a dilemma there. You're going to have to do a little bit of hand loading. But you ought to be able to use a 308 case, neck it down, and you might have to shove the shoulder back a little more than normal. And I don't know, you better you better take some real careful dimensions measuring that Cerosafe. Uh, for those who don't know what Cerosafe is, it's C-E-R-R-O-S-A-F-E, I think is the correct spelling. And it's a sort of a, a mortar that you pour into the chamber of your rifle. And then it sets up without shrinking. So when you pull it out, you can get the actual dimensions of the chamber. So it's a way to measure your chamber. You're making a fake cartridge out of this putty-like material that sets up. So that's what he did to get a, uh, a good reading. Then you take your caliper and you measure the, the head diameter and the shoulder to base length and all the different things. So you, you've got what you need to get the job done here. I think you're going to end up using a 308 case, necking it down to 270. Then you just have to figure out how you can get it to chamber so you can do some fire forming with light loads to get the uh, shoulder to blow forward to 40 degrees. But it should work. That's how the Ackley Magnums usually work. So um, I would definitely be careful with it. It sounds like you're grandfather that knew what he was doing so i hope you follow in his footsteps and do the same craig oh hey this is this is interesting craig is coming right back at us hey ron i wrote you earlier about that wildcat 270 308 mauser i inherited from papa i failed to mention that he was from filer idaho and knowing that you're in uh, the idaho region you may have known him his name was jerry eisenhower just a query no i'm afraid i did not know jerry uh, sounds like a great guy. I wish I had known him, but uh, thanks for making the connection there, Craig. Now let's go to Cullen in Texas. Do you have a 204 Ruger rifle? And if so, what is it? Uh, by golly, Cullen, I do have one. And it is kind of unusual for my collection because it is a single shot um, Encore, the old Thompson Center Encore little rifle. Um, I've never liked those for the stock lines. But for the function, I really do. That's a single barrel, single shot, outside hammer, and you can easily swap barrels. They were really popular because you could inexpensively have many different rifles shooting many different cartridges just by swapping out the barrels. 
And I got rid of most of mine, but I kept this one in 204 Ruger, which is a fun little cartridge that's uh, based on the 222 Remington Magnum neck down to take a 20 caliber bullet. Not very many 20 calibers on the market, but they are fun. And really, if you're a hand loader, inexpensive because they take very tiny little bits of metal for their bullets and very little powder. And it goes very fast, pushing 4,000 feet per second with that thing. All right, Paul from Alaska. Have you heard when Hornady is going to release the 7 millimeter PRC dies and cases and et cetera for hand loading? I was hoping you were in the loop more than the rest of us. I have barrels and an action done, and an F-class starts in a month. Now, Paul is in a hurry, guys, at Hornaday, so get those uh, supplies out to him. Paul, I do not know. I've not been questioning the guys. I know some fellas at Hornady, and I'm sure they would tell me if, if I'd just ask them. But since I just read this now, I haven't had a chance to ask. But you might just do that. They're pretty friendly over there. Just get a hold of them, go to the website and get the contact information and see when they're going to be coming out with that stuff. I would imagine that Redding and RCBS and all the rest of the die makers would be coming out with them here pretty quickly too. So jump on it and figure it out, but I'm sure they're going to be out there pretty quickly. Uh, go, good old South Dakota's popping up here. Somebody named Corey. Ron, I'm from South Dakota and I have a number of rifles and I wonder if there's another cartridge that would benefit me that I've missed, I like a collector here. Currently, I own a Ruger 1022, a Ruger M77 Mark II in 243 Winchester, a Winchester Model 70 Classic Stainless in 270, and a Browning BAR-2 Safari in 7mm Remington Magnum. I always felt that these four calibers would cover the entire gambit of all North American game. However, with the development of all these new cartridges, I'm afraid I've missed the point, so to speak. So, Ron, do you have any advice or should I leave it alone and not fix what's not broken? Corey, um, I recommend you don't fix what's not broken, but you might want to add to what's not broken. You know, a lot of this, do I need another rifle? Do I need another cartridge? It's not about need so much as want. <laughs> it is just plain fun. Face it, this is our hobby. We don't have golf clubs and tennis rackets or 15 fancy cars in a garage, but we have some rifles and we can have a lot of fun with those. So I would say the only place where you're probably a little weak is if you want to take advantage of any fun actions like a lever action or a pump action or something different. If you're only interested in calibers or cartridges, then I think you're probably all right, as you say, for anything in North America, except perhaps for stopping a charging grizzly bear or a brown bear or something big and mean like that. 4570, um, 458 Magnum, 338 Wind Mag, uh, 35 Whalen, something larger than your 7 millimeter and your 270. The 270 and 7 millimeter are awfully close. You're kind of redundant there. But I've always said that I thought the 270 Remington Magnum is pretty much the great all around. Really, not just North America, but the world. I would happily use it with the right bullets for anything. But if you want a little more horsepower, a little wider bullet, a little heavier, that's what I would fill in with. And I would probably go all the way with a 375 H&H Magnum or a 416 of some kind. The 416 Ruger, 416 Remington Magnum, 416 Rigby. Or if you really want to bite on the shoulder, 416 Weatherby Magnum. That's one I even I haven't even shot that one yet. Haven't had an opportunity, but that's the most powerful of the 416s. But of course, in North America, you don't need a 416, but it, it might give you a little more push for going to Africa. <laughs> yeah, you you get by with what you've got there, partner. Um, if you want to stick a little closer to home, not get as big as those 416s and 375s, I would look at the 338s or the 35s. 338 Win Mag is a pretty good step up from your 7 Rem Mag. And uh, the 35 Whalen, I would say, would be a step up from your 270. And those would, yeah, I mean, there's a lot more out there, but those are the ones that pop into my head right now. Good question, Corey. I hope you have fun with that. Um, just tell your wife that there's a special season coming up and you have to have a different rifle or fishing game won't let you go. <laughs> That's never worked for me with my wife, but you might try it. Now, Chad, coming out of Virginia, not just Virginia, but Southwest Virginia, he has two questions. An old friend in his 90s hunted up until about three years ago 
with the 300 Savage. How would you rank that cartridge, and what happened to it? What would you classify as the most popular North American hunting cartridges in, say, the last 60 years? Oh, that's a good one, Chad. 300 Savage, most people know it as the impetus for the 308 Winchester. And a lot of folks say that's what the 308 Winchester was made from, which isn't quite correct. But it was the inspiration for it. So around 1920, um, the 300 Savage came out as an improvement over the 3030. The 3030 was really just smoking along as the greatest deer hunting cartridge in North America. But it was pre pretty slow um, in comparison to what was, well, the 30 out 6 by then was out making, making waves. But it was a little more power than some people wanted for deer hunting. So I think Savage thought, what can we do to sort of compromise between these two? And that's where they came up with the 300 Savage. It's a short action, same length roughly as the 308 Winchester, which is why it inspired the 308 Winchester. It's a 30 caliber, like the 30 out six, which was, of course, the all American 30 30 30 out six. 308s were a 30 caliber nation. So Savage had a great idea there. Didn't burn all that much powder, didn't have all that much recoil, obviously, less recoil than the 30 out six. So what you end up with is a case that has about four grains less capacity than the 308 Winchester, just a smidgen shorter in the case itself. The neck is awfully short on it, so it's not the reloader's easiest cartridge to work with. But the reason that it's faded away was that 308. The 308 Winchester came out in 1952, and because it had a little more powder capacity and was eventually picked up by the military, it became extremely popular. And the 300 Savage faded away. Nothing wrong with that 300 Savage. It'll throw oh, 150 grain bullets probably optimum for it. And it'll throw that thing around 2,650 to maybe 2,700 feet per second. Uh, whereas the 308 now with the new powders and bullets and all, you're going to be easily getting up at 2,900 feet per second, maybe even 3,000 feet per second with the right combination. So you're getting a good two to 300 feet per second more velocity out of the 308, which is why, again, it's more popular than the 300 Savage. So, yeah, that's that's my answer on the Savage. Now, as for the, the most popular North American hunting cartridges in the last 60 years, oh boy, 60 years. I mean, you've got to go with the, the 243 Winchester that came out in 1955. I mean, that's still the most popular 24 caliber out there. So that made a big splash for light deer hunting, coyote hunting, pronghorns and stuff, light and fast for people who didn't like recoil. I think that was a good seminal invention right there. The six millimeter Remington, of course, came out at the same time and really should be more highly ranked. But because of that twist rate issue, when they started, they lost popularity right out of the gate, never really gained it back. They initially called it the 244 Remington, which I think was a cool name for a cartridge. But that one's not the winner in the 24s. And of course, the 30-06 hung in there. That's a lot longer than 60 years now, but um, that one's still, it's just beginning its descent from popularity, I think. So you've got to figure that one. The 308 then would probably rank right up there because that is the most popular 30 caliber in the country. Um, and again, it's because of the military, having it, everyone learn to shoot with it, who went to the military, and on and on it goes. The 270 Winchester was a big splash. The 7 Rem Mag was another big splash. There were just so many of them, but those kind of set the bar. And now what we have are the new 6.5 Creedmoor, I think, really needs to get jumped in there, even though it's quite young, came out in 2007. But my gosh, did that thing just jump to the top of the heap. One year, they actually sold more ammo for that than the 308 Winchester. Um, and that's sort of set the stage for all of these long, high BC bullet cartridges that we're seeing now. Everybody is moving to that. That is the biggest change in cartridges from the old days to now. We used to go more powder, more powder, more powder. Now we go more efficient bullet, more efficient bullet, more efficient bullet. So we do reduce the recoil, reduce the powder burning, and we get better performance downrange because of the efficiency of those bullets. So that I, uh, that's just kind of a quick answer on some of that stuff. But 
<laughs> we could go on and on talking about different bullets and different cartridges and why they're popular and which one's more popular. And that's kind of what we do here all the time. <laughs> so stay tuned to more Ron Spomer Outdoors podcasts. And of course, check out my regular channel at Ron Spomer Outdoors, where we discuss not only these things, but more detail about the ballistics and why things happen and why you might want them to happen or maybe not happen to your firearms and your brand of hunting. So until next time, we hope more of you will send in some well thought out and worded questions you know, with some references to what you're talking about because I do so many of these podcasts and videos and articles and blogs that if you just say, Ron, you were wrong about X, Y, and Z, I won't remember exactly where X, Y, and Z came from. <laughs> so clue me in a little bit and straighten me out and I will be happy to talk with you all. I really enjoy doing these podcasts. Thanks for all the support, folks, and especially thanks to all of our patrons on Patreon. It really helps us keep the lights on and the cameras churning. Until next time, this is Ron Spomer on Honest and Shoot Straight. <laughs>